So I want to talk to you today, uh, a very uh, short little message that I prepared. Uh, Gina, stay with me until I pray. I can sense that you are leaving me. <laughs> I want to give you, um, my sermon title is not catchy. I'm so sorry. I didn't have time. Yeah, I know you guys are cool. Um, I titled this very, very simple sermon, okay? It's just by faith, not feelings. And um, <clears throat> I want us to read a very well-known passage in the Bible. And I want us to just read the Bible a lot today. We're going to read the Bible a lot and we're going to extract some truths. Um, and I want to take you through this little message that um, I have so that you could um, have the correct perspective in your trials or in your moments of confusion or in the moments that are dark. I want to carry the wave that I started last weekend um, about being able to trust even though you don't really understand. All right? In confusion, I trust them. Um, and, and that was a very powerful message last weekend. I want to carry that wave today. All right, Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says this. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So let's pray. I want you to ask the Lord to speak to you. Father in heaven, we now commend this moment into the palm of your hands. You know every circumstance. You know every situation. You know every trouble. You know every pain, every temptation, every confusion. You know it here today. You know every single one of our hearts. You know all of our thoughts. You know the troubles that we're going through. You know the questions that we're asking. You know the answers we don't have. But in this moment, I pray and I declare that the word of the Lord will bring clarity. Amen. And I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, that if there's anything trying to distract your people tonight, I bind it now in Jesus' name. Amen. And I declare to any unclean spirit or any evil spirit, you must go now in Jesus' name. And I declare that the Holy Spirit of God is what will allow us to focus, receive the word, and inspire faith. So Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, through this moment that we're about to have together, I pray increase our faith and help anyone's unbelief. I leave this moment in the palm of your hands. May you do as you wish. Thank you for everything that you're doing. We place this message in your hands. Do as you please, Lord. Speak, for we are now listening. In Jesus' name, the church prays and we say, amen. amen. Thank you. Now you may go. Can we give it up to Gina for always playing? So Jeremiah talks about how the heart is the most deceitful thing. And uh, the reason why I want to start with that verse that a lot of you know is because um, you have to understand that there are some thoughts that come from the enemy just for one thing. And that is to misalign you. There are misaligning thoughts. And thoughts turn into feelings. And that's why if you lead a life by feelings, you could never walk in faith. And faith is required when you don't have clarity. Faith is required when you don't have all the answers. Faith is required when you don't have answers to the questions that are the most troubling in your life or the most troubling in your season. Faith is required when you don't know where to step. Faith is required when you messed up, but you still got to believe that God's grace covers you. Faith is so necessary. And this is why the Bible says that we walk by, faith. not by sight. Because if you start walking by sight, which is by what you see, your thoughts will play with your feelings. A life that is led by your feelings is an easy prey for the lion that's seeking whom to devour. A life that is led by feelings, I'm gonna say it one more time, is easy prey for the lion whom seeking whom to devour. If you are a feeling-oriented person, and all your decisions, and I'm not talking about major life decisions, I'm talking about the little life decisions. Like, will I choose to smile today or not? Will I choose to fight and actually be around people and not isolate myself like I want to? Will I choose to believe and get to church today? 
It's the little life decisions that actually make the biggest life differences. And I think our problem is that when we talk about faith over feelings, we start thinking about major decisions like where I'm going to work, if I should move to that city or not. I'm not talking about that tonight. I'm talking about the little things. I'm talking about little faith that says I'm actually going to pay attention and not tune this out. I'm talking about the little faith that says, you know what? I know that I'm going through a war right now, but I still choose to stand on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. I'm talking about little faith, the one that says, you know what? I'm going to take it one day at a time, one day at a time, just one day at a time, Lord. Little faith. Not the big faith questions. Not the big faith decisions. We already know the right thing to do when it comes to the big questions. But because the little things are little, we give little importance. So a life that is led, an emotionally navigated life, is one of the most painful lives. And that's why Jeremiah has to write to us and, and say, your heart is the most deceitful thing. And the devil knows this. And we're the only ones that don't know it. We listen to listen to your heart when he's calling for you, right? Terrible way to go. We read blogs and we watch vlogs that talk about how you should follow what you're feeling inside. No wonder we're so twisted and confused. There are misaligning thoughts that come from the enemy. Your feelings are deceitful. And what you feel doesn't always correspond to reality. Because sometimes what you feel is birthed from a false thought. You know the battlefield is in the mind. And the enemy knows that. And that's why the enemy is very, very, very good at knowing how to plant thoughts that are false. Because if you can plant a thought that is false inside your head, then he knows that he can... Um, birth a feeling inside your heart if the devil can plant a thought in your head he can birth a feeling that is felt in your heart and there's a very very clear way that we can see this and we're going to see examples of scripture all over the bible where the enemy tried this and how a thought that was birthed out of something that was seen or heard birthed a feeling in the heart you're paying attention right yes. y'all know the story of job yes. okay if you don't just let me give it to you okay job is the oldest book in the bible okay and Job was a dude that was very, very wealthy, very healthy, and he had a very, very big family with a lot of real estate and a lot of possessions. Then one day, Satan goes to heaven and he talks to God and he says, um, you know, you um, brag about Job because you've blessed him, but take everything away. He'll probably curse you. And the Bible says that God said, I trust Job so much that I'll let you take everything away from him. I'll let you, who's you? Satan. Yeah, so I'll let you take away everything from him and I know that he will still stand strong. And chapter one is just incredible. You all should read it. Yeah. But there's something very particular about chapter one that I thought was very interesting. So I want us to read it in verse 16. Another messenger arrived with this news. This was a messenger coming to Job. The fire of God. Right there, stop. That's a lie. That's a lie. It was not the fire of God. Whose fire was it? The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. So this is very crazy to me that the enemy knew how to send somebody to give a thought that was a lie in order to birth a feeling of hostility toward God. I wonder how many of you have spent years angry at God because of a one thought. I wonder how many of you felt abandoned for years because of one thought. Because the enemy hired somebody. The enemy sent a messenger, whether it was a real person a bad influence in your life, that's why you got to pay attention to who the voices in your life are. Or if it was an actual evil spirit, you know the Bible says that there are fiery arrows that get sent into our minds 
because their weapons are not carnal and so neither are the attacks sometimes. I wonder how many of you have heard one wrong thought that made you feel rejected, abandoned, ignored, or angry at God. This was exactly what was happening here. Satan sent a messenger to Job telling him, the fire of God has fallen against your stuff. Everything you're losing is because of God. And the truth was, the truth was the opposite. The one who had sent the attack was who? Satan. I wonder how many times the devil tries to attack your life, take blessing from your life, and then he wants to blame it on God. This happens, you know, this happens all the time. People, people come up to me and they're like, hey, if God is so good, then why did this bad thing happen to me? And I said, what makes you think that every good thing was your responsibility and every bad thing in your life is God's? Where did that come from? Right? A tragedy happens. We think that God was the author. A financial blessing comes. The grind, bro. It's the grind. My hustle, my side hustle. We blame all the good on us. And for some weird dumb reason, we blame all the bad on God. The fire was not from God. But this news was sent in order to awaken in Job a negative feeling towards God. The thoughts the enemy likes to place in our minds are to awaken a negative feeling toward God that doesn't correspond to the reality that God has actually given to us. Now, good things can also misalign your mind as well. The Bible says that Jesus was telling a story about a rich fool who had placed his entire trust on his finances. And then the rich man dies. And he awakens in hell. And when Jesus is telling the story, Jesus says that this guy was surprised that he was in hell. This is the problem when you lead a life based on what you feel. You know what this rich person felt? He felt security in his money. This is a very dangerous reality that could take place in our lives. When we lead a life based on what we feel instead of what God says. I wonder how many people right now are leading a life where they think everything is okay. Because they feel like everything's okay. This rich ruler felt like everything was okay. He was living life. Well, parting it up. Going to church once a month. Saying, 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 oh, oh, well, you know, like, I'm good. Like, look, 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 look at all my hustle. Like, look, look at all my properties. Look, look, look at all my cars. Look, 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 look at all my money. Look at my bank. Look at my clothes. Look at everything. I'm good. God is with me. No, he wasn't. Wow. How many people right now are like this rich ruler thinking that God is with them? but God is totally far away. And how does this play out? It's played out based on our feelings. Feelings don't promise God's presence. Obedience promises God's blessing. So I want to talk to all the people here that like you, you, you lack a biblical understanding of your relationship with Jesus. Like a lot of people think that as long as you just believe, but you don't have a relationship with the Lord, you'll be fine. And I'm telling you, you're going to be like this rich ruler. You're going to awaken in eternity very surprised. Yes. While you're having fun here on earth, that's amazing. But honestly, 80 to 100 years of life here on earth is like one grain of sand compared to all the sand in the world. That's right. What matters the most is your eternity, not right now. And some of you are living life with an earthly perspective and you're ignoring eternity. And what you don't understand is that God is trying to save you from a very big shock when you awaken. The last breath you take here commences your first breath in eternity. Yeah. 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 And there are so many of you that you're, li you're leading a life based on what you feel. And sometimes we only talk about not leading a life based on feelings when it comes to bad, sinful things. But we forget that sometimes the good things in life, the blessings in life, 
the money in life, the good job and a good career in life, those feelings can lead us astray as well. Here's another person that was le leading a life based on their feelings. Samson. Samson was told, hey, you, you don't, 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 be sexual don't be sexually immortal. That was his instruction. And don't get drunk. You're not supposed to get drunk and you're not supposed to be sexually immoral. What's our generation doing now? Getting drunk and being sexually immoral. And, and I'm here to tell you, like, if that's you here today, there, there's no judgment. We love you, man. And, and you'll always have a space of grace here. We're not here to judge you, but we, we are here to tell you that you need to wake up because like Samson, we can also be put in a place that is very unfortunate. And here's what happened to Samson. He was flirting with what God said not to. He was in proximity towards someone that God was saying, don't be. And what did Samson do? He thought, I can handle it. Isn't that our response always? Here's the problem. We feel like we can handle it. But what you feel isn't always what corresponds to reality. And so Delilah, which was the bad person in here, Samson was flirting with her, flirting, and he had many warnings. When you read the story, you really go, what an idiot, right? But I'm telling you, sometimes we play that idiot role too. All these red flags and we're still with the person. Like all these red flags, like, like your name is not your name on his contact list. That's a red flag. Like, that's shady, man. That's very sus. You know, th there's a certain time of day that, or a certain time of the night that he will not pick up your phone calls. That's weird. Okay, so, 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 let's go back. Like Samson, like Samson, okay? He flirted and flirted and flirted until he got to the point where he was so much in proximity that the enemy found out what his weakness was. Remember that Samson was the strongest man on earth. Yeah. And the most saddest verse that you could ever read comes to play. He woke up from a nap on Delilah's lap. He was bound. That's imagery. When you're resting in a time of war, the enemy's binding you. That's why you can't rest in a time where you have to fight. And I'm wondering how many of you need to fight for your spiritual life and you're not fighting because you're just too busy Netflixing. Hey, or you're just too busy scrolling on your phone when you should actually be praying. Woo! And what you don't realize is that while you're resting, the enemy's binding. Yeah. And that's what happened to Samson. He was resting on her lap. She bound him up. And then the Bible says that he wakes up and he says, oh, I'll break out of this just like before. And, then the, and, and, and this is the saddest part. The word of the Lord says, but Samson had not realized that God was no longer with him. Wow. How did he end up in a place like that? Feelings. While well, you're feeling the good stuff, man, you don't see that the enemy's working behind the scenes. While you're in that pleasure, you don't realize that you're opening doors to the demonic. Whether well, it's you sleeping with somebody, you watching pornography, watching horror movies, all these things open doors. And you don't understand that while you're doing that, you're being bound just like Samson. And there comes a moment in our spiritual life where we become so helpless and hopeless. And that's exactly what happened to Samson. The Bible says that they cuffed him up, chained him up, gouged his eyes. That's his vision leaving. And he was no longer strong. And it all started with feelings. I was going to say this later, but 
I'll say it right now and I might say it again later. See, sometimes the relationship that we think will cure our loneliness is the relationship that will end our intimacy with Jesus. I think that was good that you should have clapped a little louder, a little quicker, a little faster. When you're led by your feelings and not by what God is saying, you will run to a relationship thinking that you're going to have your loneliness and your rejection cured. But what you don't realize is that right behind that mask of blessing is the true face of a curse. And that curse is, it's going to take you away from the most important relationship of your entire life. The only relationship that can save you. The only relationship that could heal you. The only relationship that could redeem you. Do you know how many people in here, in our city, are in need of redemption? Do you know what redemption means? Redemption is like when you're just completely at your lowest. You feel worthless, shameful, dirty. And you don't feel like you're worthy enough to stand up and show your face to people. Because you've done too many things or too many things have been done to you. What you need is your redeemer. That's Jesus. Jesus Christ can redeem the soul. Jesus Christ redeems the mind. And that's what you need. I want to give you some examples of hearing a bad thought. And the first one is David. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1. And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. He said where? Come on, come on, come on, come on. It was just literally like, like 10 seconds ago. He said it in his heart. That's the mind. Proverbs, I think 23 verse 7 or 27 verse 3, I forget which one. Says that as a person thinks in their heart, so they are. David had a thought. And that thought that he was going to perish that thought that came in harbored and it gave birth to one of your greatest enemies fear and the crazy thing is that the truth was the exact opposite the thought was i'm going to perish i'm going to get killed by saul's hand the truth was that God actually wanted to promote him. While David was thinking, I'm going to be eliminated, God was saying, I'm going to elevate you. But what happens when you allow your feelings to lead? You take turns and you take roads in life that you were never meant to walk in. You make decisions that bring more pain. You bring trials in your life that you were not supposed to suffer. Why? Because of what you believed. How are you in this season right now? Maybe you're going through something difficult. Maybe you're going through a hard trial. Maybe you've been going through it for a while, for a while now, a long time now. And I'm wondering, who are you listening to? What are the thoughts inside your head that you are coming into agreement with? <laughs> because we could be like David sometimes. We think we're going to die. But it's actually God just trying to promote you. A second person that I believe was very interesting was Elijah. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And Elijah was afraid and fled for his. And the Bible says something very interesting. That Elijah wanted to die. Okay. What you see. What you hear. And what you feel. Can play games with your heart. What you see. What you hear. What you feel. Can misalign your life. This is exactly what happened. Jezebel threatened Elijah. But one thing that we've never paid attention to is this. Look. Jezebel threatened to kill him. So he was going to die. That's what Jezebel threatened him with, right? Did you know that the truth 
behind God's plan for Elijah was so opposite and so contradictory to what fear was saying that Jezebel ended up falling off her building. She died and got eaten by dogs. And Elijah never even tasted death. Because he got raptured by a chariot of fire by God? Isn't that crazy? I said, isn't that crazy? The exact opposite, that, was, that fear was talking, was truth. It was the opposite. Fear wanted to say, you're dead. Fear wanted to say, it's over. Fear wanted to say, you're going to die. Your ministry's done. You're not going to do anything. But God was saying, you are so blessed that you ain't even going to taste death, Elijah. You're so blessed. Like God sent a VIP chariot of fire to pick him up. So I'm wondering how many of you right now are believing the exact opposite of what God has planned for you. The word of the Lord says that God has good plans. I got to trust that. I got to believe that. In my trial, in my dark days, in my confusing days, I got to hang on to God and believe that he has good plans. Not to harm me, but to prosper me. To elevate me, to use me, to anoint me, to prosper, bless me. And for those of you that are close to me, you know that I'm not speaking this out of hype. Yeah, that's right. You know my lonely dark days are true. Yeah. They're not lonely, but they are dark. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded evil, man. <laughs> Here's another one. Elisha had a servant. And the Bible says, you know the story that a whole entire army came to surround Elisha. And Elisha had a servant that saw it and panicked and feared. And Elisha's servant was a carnal man. And carnal people ignore that there are two realities. The one that your natural eyes are seeing and your natural ears are hearing. And then there's a spiritual reality that only your spiritual eyes can see through faith. So the Bible says that Elisha's servant panicked and freaked out and said, oh no, Elisha, look, we're surrounded by the army of the enemy. And Elisha raised up a prayer and said, God, have mercy on this kid. Open his real spiritual eyes. And the word of the Lord says that there was an army of chariots of fire surrounding the army that was surrounding them. And here's the important thing to understand. Dude, Elisha never ignored and never denied the army of the enemy. Faith doesn't mean delusion. Faith doesn't mean that you speak nonsense and be like, oh no, there is no pain here. <laughs> or there is no trouble. Or there is no confusion. That's not faith. Faith knows that there are troubling times because Jesus said, in this world you will have afflictions. But faith, a, a, a spiritual man, a spiritual woman, doesn't just see the trouble. Doesn't just listen to the pain. They see it, they hear it. But they hang on. And they trust the hand of the Lord. Deep down within their soul, they find enough strength to believe. God is their strength. A carnal man panics, freaks out, runs, hides, isolates, disbelieves, doubts, prophesies doom with their mouth. But a spiritual person, a spiritual woman, a spiritual man, they look and search deep within their soul. And they hang on to hope. Just like Elisha. He did not panic. The lies that the enemy tells you are crazy. And it's crazy because it all starts with one thought. One thought from the enemy that we choose to believe. Here are some thoughts that the enemy will tell you. You'll never get delivered. 
and you believed it. Here's another one. You'll never be healed from this. The sickness that you have, nah, you're going to die with it. And what's our problem? We believe the lie. Here's another one. You're finished. Your good days are over. We believe them. Here's another one. Your family will never come to Jesus. And we believe the lie. Here's another one. No one in this church likes you. Here's another one. Your pastor uses the offering money to buy expensive shoes. I swear it happens. It's so sad. People make up these beautiful, and, and, and guess what? And guess what? The enemy's an expert at knowing how to divide you from your church. And he will say nasty things to you. Because look, while you're sleeping, if you don't pray before you go to bed, all oh, you're going to pray before you go to bed today. If you don't pray before you go to bed, you know who sits on your bed at night talking to you? Like, listen, man. The enemy will sit on your bedside and whisper lies so that you wake up feeling angry, troubled, or confused. And one of the best things that he likes to do is to confuse you and turn you from your church. So he will whisper lies. And all these lies begin with a thought, but then these thoughts give birth to a feeling. And if you are a feeling navigated person, you will make many painful wrong decisions. Now here's the right mindset. We're going to go back to Job. Job 14, 14. I'm almost done. Look what Job says. Will the dead live again? All my days are a struggle. But watch this. But I will wait until my change comes. <laughs> so many of you could relate to this. Where it's been dark for many years. Maybe many weeks, many months. But we have to have the right mindset that Job had. Job had hope and he said, he said, he, he said, I will wait until my change comes. When you're going through something dark and something evil, something painful, the last thing that we sometimes think about is the blessing and the reward that God has for us. And we're so focused on the trouble and we're so focused on the pain. But that is the quickest way to sink. I'm going to give you advice. If you're going through something painful, something confusing, you have to place your eyes on hope. You have to think about the future. You've got to think about what God is going to do. If you forget that God is going to use this for your betterment and for the betterment of those that are underneath your voice, because everybody here is a leader one way or another. If you forget that, you will sink quick. Let's keep reading. You will call, and I will answer you. When you're going through a dark season, sometimes the hardest thing is to pray. And I'm, I'm telling you that through my, my difficult moment, one of the hardest things for me in this season was to pray, to read the Bible, and to watch sermons. I couldn't do it. And then that taught me a lesson. That sometimes the people that I lead, it's not that they don't want to get close to God. It's just that they're too weak and they can't. So God changed my heart and he made me become more understanding that some people, it's not that they don't want to do their devotional. It's just that they're struggling. So the Lord made me more compassionate. Praise God. Because, you know, when you're leading, right, and you're ignorant because, you know, sometimes you're ignorant to people's pain. Uh, I'm so sorry if I've ever done that to you. Uh, forgive me from, from, from the bottom of my heart. Um, I would see people that would not do the devotionals like, like, like you know, five weeks in a row. Like, Is this guy even a believer, man? <laughs> you know what's wrong with this guy? Five weeks in a row, he doesn't do it, right? But, but, but now that God put me through a fire, and as the pastor of your church, I couldn't even open up my Bible, and I couldn't even pray. Some days, I only had the strength to say, God, help me. And that was it. That's all I could pray. Nothing else. Now I understand. And so, um, you will call, and I will answer you. 
you will desire the creature your hands have made, which is talking about himself. Now look at this. Then you will count my steps, but you will not keep track of my sin. My wrongs will be closed up in a bag and you will cover up my sin. Someone give him praise for that. So in, in his trial, the, the most suffered man understood how to have hope. Look, look, what, look what else he says in chapter 19. I know that there is someone to defend me and that he lives. And in the end, he will stand here on earth and defend me. After I leave my body and my skin has been destroyed, I know I will see God. I will see him with my own eyes. I myself, not someone else, will see God. Watch this, watch this. And I cannot tell you how excited that makes me feel. Now, why is that such a powerful verse? Because we have to take into context what he was going through. He lost all his daughters in one day. He lost all his sons in one day. He lost all his homes in one day. He lost his health in one day. He lost all his money in one day. Dude, just losing a son is enough to put you like in bed for weeks. This guy lost everything. And on top of that, he didn't have a supportive wife. She's a like, curse your God and die, Job. And, and you have no idea how painful that is because when going through pain and someone tells curse God and die, Dude, you lose all hope. But one thing that we see from this passage through the trial that he was going through is this. That Job had everything taken away from him. But one thing that he would not allow to be taken was his hope. Faith. So I have two pieces of advice to give you. And I'm going to end with this. When you're going, oh, and by the way, John chapter 20, verse 19, Jesus says this, blessed are those who believe without seeing me. So you must trust the Lord in your circumstance. In, in your confusion, you, you must trust the Lord. I, I, I really pray that those of you that are suffering and, and those of you that are going through something difficult, I really pray that this really, really resonates in your spirit and it brings you hope. Trust, we must trust the Lord. Even if it looks like it's the opposite even if it looks like he left, even if it feels like he's not there. I, I'm here to tell you not out of mere theory. I'm telling you out of life experience when you don't understand and you're in your dark days and you're suffering like Job, don't lose faith. Trust the Lord. Here are two things, two pieces of advice that I can give you when you're going through something that's hard. Number one, find voices of faith. Now listen to this, and I'll tell you why that's important. Because we typically find people, and we like to gravitate towards people who will agree with our feelings, rather than finding people who will actually speak faith. There are many of us that will actually gravitate towards people that will give us an approval to be pitiful. Or that will actually pity us. Or we will look for people that will say yes to the wrong decision for us to medicate on something else other than God. So when you're going through something difficult, don't find people that will say yes to your folly. And also, don't isolate. You must get around people that will speak life and faith into your heart. There are moments where you don't even want to hear it. Trust me, I know this. There are moments where I don't want to hear the faith anymore. Because you just want to be like, shut up, you don't understand anything. You keep telling me that it's going to be all right. But I don't feel that way right now. So then I had to ask my question, then what do I want to hear? What do I want to hear then, Marlon? So-and-so is speaking life into you. So-and-so is speaking faith into you. And you are getting mad because they don't understand. So what do you want to hear? You want to hear that it's all going to be doom and gloom for you? Is that what you want? <laughs> do you want to be left alone with Satan? So that he can get you darker and put you into a deeper spiral? Yeah? So look, this piece of advice sounds so stupid and cliche. Yeah? But it's not. 
It's not. Yeah. This literally can save your mind from breaking. You must know how to ask for help. Ask for help. Turn to your neighbor and be like, ask for help. Turn to the other neighbor that you ignored for no reason and say, ask for help. <laughs> Can you believe I deleted my note? <laughs> It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I got it all down. <laughs> the second piece of advice is this. Trust God all the more. Okay. I know that this sounds super cliche. I didn't have enough time to make it more creative. But here's what I want to tell you. When the pain gets stronger, trust God all the more. When your season gets darker, trust God even more. When your circumstance becomes more confusing, trust God all the more. Amen. The darker things get, the more you must trust. Amen. Here's a quote that I want to give you, and this is my last thing on my thing. When doubt visits you, don't panic, because your breakthrough is closer. Amen. Someone say amen. amen. So, I don't know what the holidays brought to you. Because <laughs> I know that holidays sometimes... <laughs> I know that holidays sometimes could uh, mix up a lot of emotions, mix up a lot of things. Um, I know that sometimes winter um, could be the darkest, darkest, darkest moments for families uh, or for individuals. But in this season, what I want to challenge our church to do is to really lead a life of faith. And everything that we read about in the scriptures points out that there are troubling times. There are moments that are painful. And you will have moments that are dark and confusing. I'm going through that myself. But even in my confusing dark moments, I have a choice. I either let my feelings lead my choices or I let faith. So you, you, all of you, this is a season not to Stay at home. This is a season not to be casual and relaxed. This is a season where we must press further. This is not the season to medicate on other things. This is not the season to use people to distract yourself from pain. This is a season where you must press forward in faith. Knowing that your Redeemer lives and your deliverance is coming. Your breakthrough is coming. And I can tell you this, that like through my circumstance, uh, the problem and the, and the trial that I've been going through, you know, sermons like the ones that I preached, I would never like to preach because I would find them too, um, too cliche, too plain and too simple. Um, not enough structure for me. But I'm coming to find that as the Lord breaks me, and as the Lord presses me, uh, sometimes these messages that are so cliche and simple or a small, or a breath of fresh air for the soul to breathe. Yeah. So I pray that it blesses you. And I pray that um, you may understand that yes, every person goes through hard times. But not every person chooses faith. But tonight, you can. Amen.